come to Clearly Meant. This is the poetry series that I run here uh, at the Clement Branch of the Berkeley Public Library. This is the beginning of our fourth year. Um, we, we do three poets a year. Uh, the poet uh, comes in, reads for about 20 minutes, sits for an interview for about 20 minutes, and then audience discussion for the last remainder of the hour. Um, my name is Glenn Ingersoll. I'm a poet myself, and um, I'm happy that I get to run a poetry series where I work, and it's a nice place. And welcome. I hope you come back again sometime. Uh, I'm going to introduce Jair, who um, I became familiar with both as a regular uh, visitor to our branch and um, attendee of the uh, series. I'm going to read from his bio. Jair is a poet, spoken word artist, arts curator, and activist. His books are Collage, an assemblage of divergent poetry juxtaposed. I think he has some copies of that with him today. Uh, also, Touch, Poems and Other Writings of Love, Erotica, and Sensuality. His work has been included in anthologies and magazines, from Mighty Real to Black Gay Genius. Jire performs on radio and television, Poets Jazz House, uh, Mine Mike Radio Show, two examples, and coordinates spoken word, word events, uh, Revolve Oakland Pride Creative Arts and Film Festival, Q-Ball Na National Queer Arts Festival, for example. Uh, Jerry is a Libra, loves the Lakers, and is known for his fried chicken. So, welcome, Jerry. Thank you very much. I don't have to decide if I'm going to stand or sit yet. So, <laughs> I'm trying to decide now. Um, I think I'm going to sit right now. Okay, would you like me to lower this so that uh, you can put your stuff on there? I'll, I'll, I'm not standing with the Lakers. So. <laughs> Let's see how it goes. Thank you guys for being here. Um, I um, actually first came to a poetry, uh, Glenn also hosts a, po a monthly poetry circle um, that's also held in this room. And it's a bunch of people who come who enjoy poetry. Um, and you could read your own, or he also pulls books from the shelves and puts them on the table. And you can read um, from any, some of those books. And I actually found some, uh, discovered some poets I didn't know um, through that, through coming to that. And that's where I first met him. And then, like you said, I've been a regular patron of this branch. Um, I was saying to John, it's probably my favorite branch of the Berkeley branches. This one and, and Toria Hall Pittman are like, you know, two of my favorites. So. Thanks for the plug. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, and, um, he asked me you know, over a year ago to do this, and like he says, he only does it three times a year, so they're planned out pretty far in advance. And um, when he got the dates for this year, he emailed me, and I was like, sure, I'd love to. So, so thank you for having me here. Um, I'm actually going to start with some a couple of poems that are new that haven't been published anywhere yet, um, just because I like to put them out in the atmosphere and get feedback. One, I don't think it's finished yet, so I'm going to do that one second. This one, um, I believe it's finished, but you know, as writers, I'm going to edit, but... Uh, Can I go on? <laughs> that's up to you. <laughs> Is it okay? What was the question? Is it okay to go on? He wants to go on. It's fine with me. It's up to, yeah. it's it's up up to uh, <laughs> our reader, whether what his uh, permissions are. <laughs> So this is called, um, I Know Secrets. I know secrets. Secrets never told to me, but passed on to me through my DNA. These secrets have abided in the abyss of family conversations and interactions, but never surface. Hidden, unexposed, dwelling in the sunken place. Caskets lowered into the ground. Secrets reside in the troposphere. Ashes are scattered. Secrets escape like butterflies from cocoons. I want to tell them they are not mine to tell. 
They were passed on through bone marrow and occasionally trickle into the temporal lobe of my cerebrum, searching for release through unanswered questions and momentary glimpses of ancestral psyche. Like apparitions hunting someplace in between this realm and the other side of transition, they wander, seeking. Like a gaseous mixture rising, they walked into the zephyr. I inhale them, taking them into my body, soul, and mind. Secrets unknown, yet I know them because they were passed on to me in my DNA. And um, this is the one that um, I don't think is finished. And right now it's called Entitled for Now, because I don't have time. So, um, I am floating like a feather that never falls to the ground. Sensitive, unguided, liberated in the zephyr, whispering into the atmosphere stories of the ancestors. Infinite and supernatural tones pass from generation to generation that have been seated in my psyche. Through poetry and room, hymn and sonnet, stanza and pre-verse, I speak their incantations into existence. So that may or may not be finished. I haven't decided yet. <laughs> I have to sit with it for a while. Um, okay, I'm going to stand for this one. Um, this is uh, considered my signature piece. Um, a lot of people laugh when they see Jagger, the literary masturbator. And maybe I'll tell the story about how that came about after I do the piece, or maybe we can talk about it later. So, <laughs> Include it in the interview if you like. Okay, we'll do that. So, um, but yeah, this is my signature piece, and it has a couple of swear words in it, so if you're sensitive to that, um, just be aware of that. And, um, and I always tell people, if you hear people either reading or performing parts of this, they stole it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a literary masturbator, a vocabulary manipulator, a spoken word exhibitionist. I get off when people watch me do what I do. Sometimes when I stand up in front of a crowd and bust what I got to give, it feels like my orgasmic dictionary fantasy coming true. You see, I hope these rhymes will seduce and titillate you, hide your audio erotic sensibilities. I'm really trying to catch you on the terminology spell. I want my verbiage to go at you, come at you so strong and sensual that not only will you be able to hear it, it'll seem as if you can touch, taste, see, and inhale the smell. The intercourse from my mouth to your ear will be like practicing the Kama Sutra, finding different ways to explore each other during our conjugal session, bringing pleasure and delight. It's just you and me, baby. This poem. It's for you. Let the lexus work you and occupy your thoughts night after night after night. We'll find the rhythm and stroke until we tingle our body shivers from the expressions I give you from the thoughts that have been the foreplay in my mind. I throw out terms to take you to places unknown. I'm really trying to hit that spot to make your muscles tighten and unwind. Brain fucking our way to end of the time here using language as a lubricant and comprehension as a condom. It breaks. <laughs> and now you're all present with my pauses, just stating the seeds of wolves that I release as my shuddering spasm of word feast has slammed into your ears and released the desire for you to give my thoughts a place to ripen, grow, and swell. Speak. Bear my offspring. Let our child come forth. You'll need no ever do to produce from your lingual lusting womb. It'll be born into a world where metaphor assemblies and the diversity of idioms that some poetry reading have come to commune. It's like I've taken some sort of herbal, verbal Viagra. I really have to feed this craving I have to get off. Nouns, verbs, and adjectives all inspire and command my phraseology penis to never go soft. But this scenario is really all in my mind. I'm going to save these feelings and stimulations for a time when I can use them for later. I'll be all alone, partaking in a furious session of glossarial self-love. I want to thank you all for, list for listening to the confessions of a literary masturbator. <laughs> so.
I know we're going both that way. So I'm going to read from this book. This is the latest book. Um, it's um, poems that were collected over and collected and written over a, a while. And so when I started putting it together, I really didn't have a central theme for it. And that's why it ended up being called Collage. And, um, but there is a title piece called Collage, so I'll, I'll read that first. There are many me's in the universe. Scattered reflections, snapshots, images, fragments to remember, each distinct. Here is a collage of poetry pasted together, representing I am. I'm just going to jump around and hear a little bit. I'm not, I'm still not sure what I'm going to read. So. Um, oh, there's a, a couple of them in here, if you guys have the time, that um, I've been trying to use this idea of video poetry. And so I have some uh, video poetry on my YouTube channel where I put the words to music and images. So um, if I read any of those, I'll point it out. So if you just want to go back later on YouTube and, and look that up, um, you What's can take a look. Channel? Um, it is the Jair the Literary Masturbator. <laughs> so, everything on the internet that has to do with me is either Jair the Literary Masturbator or the Literary Masturbator, except for Twitter. Um, the Literary Masturbator is too long and there is just lit masturbator. So. Okay, I'll do this one. It's called Questioning, Questioning Like Langston. What happens to the blood shed on cement? Does it see through and clot to give new life? Do people even realize someone died there or do they pass by to make their train? Does the blood hunt the platform where Oscar Grant was shot? Does it speak, clinging to life, chest heaving as the blood gurgles out of his mouth? You shot me, he said. I have a daughter, he said, as people scream from the train. Mistaken taser for gun fired point blank into his back. Mistaken taser for gun fired for point blank to his back on a cement platform on the first day of a new year before dawn. Never again will he taste his grandmother's gumbo, no horseback rides for his daughter. His nieces and nephews will no longer feel his hands to tickle them. His mother will never hug him again. No more birthdays. As the train departs the platform at Crew Bell Station, wheels screeching, whistling into the cold night. Today I will get caught in the act of loving myself. I will dance naked and celebrate the incredible creation of me. I will let it be known to the universe I am divine. The size and fullness of my body, the peanut butter color of my skin, it's all good. It's truly exceptional. I will grant myself permission to exalt in the praise of me. I'll do this one. It's kind of a, well, I guess they're all personal since they're poems, but, um, yeah. It's called The Times of the Jingle Jangle Colors of Mom's Movement. More and more I find myself thinking about the times of the Jingle Jangle Colors of Mom's Movement. There she'd be in the kitchen wearing a house dress with its bright colors and her blue fluffy house shoes. She would sit in the kitchen and roll her tresses using sponge curlers, jerkins lotion, and her pressing comb, carefully straightening her hair while watching Lawrence Welk on the small black and white TV, getting ready on a Saturday night for Sunday morning because the rule of the house was no matter what you did on Saturday night, you were going to church on Sunday morning. For those were the times of the jangle colors of Mama's movement. Before the onset of hypertension concerns, on Saturday mornings there would be scrambled eggs with cheese, jimmy Dean pork link sausage, and grits. Sometimes salmon croquettes, maybe even leftover fish or fried chicken from Friday night. Papa liked stuff like hominy and okra. He's country like that. 
She cook it all and have a fresh pot of focused coffee percolating. After breakfast, we could watch cartoons, Fat Albert and the Cosmic Kids, or Bugs Bunny, then in between the shows, sing along to Schoolhouse Rock, Conjunction Junction, I'm Just a Bill, and 5, 10, 15, 20. For these were the times of the Jean Django colors of Mama's Moon. Nobody could make a meal like my mama. One time, the skin of the fried chicken bird. She peeled it off and smothered that chicken in homemade gravy. With the biscuits and rice she served, it made it the best meal. We even had homemade ice cream. Back in those days, we had to take turns turning the handle. And of course, now those machines are electric. It's amazing what went on during the times of Jingle Jangle Colors of Mama's Moon Moon. Whether she was watching her Saturday Western or snapping green beans, there are moments that could never be replaced or duplicated, like watching the roller derby or being sent to the store for PC powder and then being told to get in the house before the street lights came on. It all seems so simple. I didn't even realize we didn't have a lot of money because we were rich in other ways. I look back fondly and now understand the value of the time spent and the jingle jangle colors of Mama's movement. I think folks should tip poets and spoken word artists like they do strippers and drag queens. It's not easy to turn a phrase that sets your mind ablaze, that leaves you spellbound for days, and guides you to clarity as if you emerge from a maze, amazed. I love creating that word haze that makes you search for meaning in your metaphor and simile, a, a labyrinth of vocabulary. Use your real eyes to realize our truth is in the complexity of lexicon destiny. We don't tell real lies. When vocable is no longer valuable, we shall cease from speaking. The currency of our communication is in our ability to exchange idioms and lexicons as if they were commodities on the stock market. Invest in adverbs, adjectives, nouns, and conjunctions. What's your question? A dollar will make me holler, make it rain if I ignite your membrane. Poets and spoken word artists deserve tips for the quips that spill from our lips. In the beginning was the word, so let it be written, so let it be done. According to Wallace Stevenson and Adagia, the poet is the priest of the invisible. Hear me when I say, the verbiage I speak unlocks the mysteries of the universal love of language. I'm not just spewing forth verbosity or regurgitating logaria, I'm opening my heart for this art, and for that, I deserve a tip. Touch and other writings of lover writing and sensuality. This is the first collection of poetry I put out that was all mine, uh, besides being part of a, 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 an anthology. Um, it's kind of old baby in some places. <laughs> so I'll read some that are uh, a little bit more on the uh, easier side. Um, at Poet Jazz House, which is in LA, we, used to, um, we started at 8. And we had these uh, kids come from Job Corps. And um, so we, had, we couldn't do poetry that had swear words in it or that was erotic or anything like that. And so um, we started at 8, then around 9.30, 9.45, we'd take a break. And then we'd start back up at again at 10. And so um, we started this thing called After 10 Poetry. So, there were some of us who had after 10 poetry, so <laughs> this book can, contains like after yeah, 10 poetry. Sure. <laughs> so, um, but I'm going to read some that I can do before 10. This is after 10, so. Yes, it's after 10. <laughs> we can say it's after 10. It's after 10, so we're, we're <laughs> You'll have to read it on your own. <laughs> what, and what is the name of this book? It's called Touch, Poems, and Other Writings of Love, Erotic, and Sensualities. And I also have copies of this one for sale. Today. And, and it's available. It's available online as well. Both of them are actually. So, yeah. um, and this one is called My Love and It's Like. My Love and It's Like Peach Cobbler. Sweet to the taste with a fresh dough like embrace. My kisses are like hot melted butter baked inside of a clear pirate's dish. I have nothing to hide. You can see all of my ingredients. Sometimes you can even get my love with a scoop of homemade ice cream on top. Don't get it twisted, my loving is lip-smacking, finger-looking, and good to the last drop. 
but be aware, not just some after dinner delight or holiday treat. My loving is like peach collar because I'm a deep dish conscious brother from the top of my head to the sole of my feet. With a long lasting aftertaste of comfort and soul, I'm talking make you, make you slap your mama good, Destiny's Child can you keep up, or we just yelling he's out of control. You want a taste of my fresh fruity love? What are you afraid of? Did you forget your fork? <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I'll just read it and then we'll go from there. This is another in my um, series of uh, when I was really in, in the whole Urban Master Mingo phase. It's called Word Hub. Word Hub. I hear what they say about me. They call me a Word Hub because I'll do anything for the term of praise. I'll give it up to anyone who has a large adjective. I use the dictionary as a self-pleasuring aid and a thesaurus is porn. All I need is the ingestion of nouns and verbs and it's like Spanish fly. It gets me willing, hungry, and high. I'm the tramp that took on a whole team of metaphors, one right after the other. I don't know their names. I have no shame. I guess what they say about me is true, but I don't know what else to do. I hang out late night in places where poets, writers, actors, comedians, and other sus suspicious types congregate. We verbally fornicate, and I hope to snag a bait that will titillate me for the night. I travel from place to place with no disgrace, sitting in coffee houses, lounges, and theaters, begging for tongues to wag and flip me all over with their expressions. I ask myself sometimes, what I have used as a child? Is that why I'm this way? Yeah, it must have been those teachers that molested me with my angel of lace and hues and Ernest Hemingway. The Scarlet Letter by Nathaniel Hawthorne. I remember reading it for the first time. It took my vocabulary virginity, my colloquial cherry, and left me marked desiring with words and pre verse novels, haiku, and words and rhyme. I too wear a large chain on my breast for an adulterous admirer of authors. I can go back further in my memory and place the blame on the TV shows, The Electric Company, and Zoom. Yeah, that's why I'm always trying to come up with enough money to get a room in bookstores, those places that cater to word holders. They stock their shelves with books and magazines, luring me into their dens of literary stimulation. I read and get turned on by the classics. And then there's a new bookshelf, writers who don't know my reputation. They call for me to dig in my wallet and come up with enough money so I will take them home. Sometimes they are with me for only a night, but sometimes if I've gotten something verbose and thick, it takes a while before we're done. But it's always the same, and before you know, I'm out again searching, lurking, looking for more terms to penetrate me and make me theirs. Even in music, song lyrics can make me, make me their willing bitch. Here's Stevie saying, until the day that eight times eight times eight is four, until the day that is the day that is no more, scratches my itch. They know they have me, the words own me, and terminology is my pimp, so what can I do? I just shared a poem, and somebody, someone might sing a song or a recommended book. So what does that make you? How are we on time? Let's have one more, or just a longish one, or two short ones. Okay. I'll find some. Um, this one is in the chat book, so um, you all have a copy of it. Yeah. It's called The Weary Blues. I am tired, and I have no words. I consider myself to be astute and a bit of a wordsmith, but I have nothing to say. It's as if I am numb. Another death of a black person by police. What am I to say? While people want to call the Black Lives Matter movement a terror terrorist organization, and disparage the legacy of the Black Panthers. I take a breath to respond, but then I realize it's best to keep my mouth shut. Those type of people don't want to know the truth anyway. So I have nothing to say. 
I don't want to have to attend another vigil of protest. I don't want to have to acknowledge the anniversary of happening because I begin to feel like since every day is someone's birthday, every day will be a day that someone died while in police custody. And the thought of that wears me out. I'm weary, and Old Man River just keeps rolling along. The names become blurry and out of focus, and I'm afraid if I recite them, I'll never stop speaking. Maybe I'm just tired of remembering who and how it happened, and that the justice system either didn't charge anyone or let the person we saw kill them on video get away with it. Please do not bring up the false equivalent of black on black crime, because black people who kill other black people more than likely will spend time in jail for it. Saying all lives matter is also a misnomer. As D. D. Ray McKesson says, I would never go to a breast cancer fundraiser and point out colon cancer matters. There was a church that had the best of intentions when they posted on their outdoor display that because Jesus died, all lives matter. Yet there were two other people who were hung on, the cross, on, hung on crosses at the same time. As Reverend William Barber III so eloquently pointed out, Jesus was a brown-skinned Palestinian Jew. Being pro-black is not anti-police or anti-white. When Michelle Obama makes the point that her daughters through her are descendants of slaves and it does not escape her that they have woken up in a house for eight years that, for eight years that, was, that, that slaves built, she is recognizing the progress that has been made socially and culturally by the society, but then some pundit has to make themselves feel better by saying that the slaves were well-fed and well-housed when they were hired. And then it hits me the three-fifths compromise. There are many in this country whose belief system is rooted in the idea that we are not fully human. It's a systematically ingrained racist notion that if we are human, we aren't fully human unless we are at the service of those in power. To serve ourselves and speak for ourselves does not occur to their way of thinking. And my great, great, great grandfather is somewhere in the atmosphere wondering what happened to that 40 acres and a mule that was discussed. But he got tired of waiting. And now that weirdness has been passed down through generations and sometimes feels like a noose around my neck, it binds me like shackles on my wrists and feet. So, so, so Tamir, if you just hadn't, hadn't had that toy gun, Eric, if you just didn't sell those cigarettes, if you'd lost weight, you would have been able to breathe. Belando, if you didn't have that license to carry a gun, even though the NRA is okay with a white man having the Second Amendment right to purchase a semi-automatic weapon at a gun show without a background check. Oscar, if you hadn't rode Bart that night, Alton side hustles are not for you. Freddie, if you just had to drop yourself into the back of that police van. You know what it reminds me of? It's like when you fall and skin your knees and they bleed and scab over. You know there is healing under the scab of injustice, and even though you are a patient, another incident happens to rip the scab off your knees, exposing them again to the pain of the inequality. How long do we have to be on our knees praying, waiting for justice? I am tired. about 
poetry didn't save your life. And it, it did. But it did help me heal. And I started writing poetry in my journal to heal myself mm -hmm. since situations haven't ever gone on. And that's where it started. Um, and then, for some reason, um, someone asked me to share a piece at something. And so I did. I shared it. And then people came up to me and they actually liked it. I was like, really? Because, you know, it's so personal. It's in my, I mean, I actually took my journal to that first thing. I didn't print it out. And I took my journal and it was, it was handwritten. It wasn't typed up. Because I figured, oh, okay, I'll do it. But, you know. And um, so that's where it started for me. It, you know, I was an adult. I wasn't like one of those kids that was, you know, knew all the poets through school. <laughs> you know, I knew some, you know, like I said, but yeah, I, I got to it late. I enjoyed reading your stuff. I enjoyed hearing you uh, present it. Uh, you, um, I like the way you think your way through a piece as it's happening. It doesn't feel like it's all thought out ahead of time and then beaten into shape, yeah. into one shape. Um, the Weary Blues, the one that you read, <coughs> that I included, that I included in the um, chat book, uh, has that thoughtful quality. Um, and it's not just anger. There's anger in it, but there's also humor in it and sadness, of course. Um, can you talk about your process, writing process a little bit? Yeah, um, like I said, with the, the second piece I read, I don't know if it's finished yet. Um, I think, um, well, I'll, I'll start about me. I, I, I write now on my computer, um, and so it's saved. And things I don't think are finished yet, I'll go back and look at it. Um, and then I'll know if it's finished. With that particular piece, The Weary Blues, I knew what I wanted to say. Um, sometimes I have the germ of an idea of what I want to say. Um, but I don't know how to put it together. Um, I saw, I think it must have been on PBS, they had um, a writer sing, and it was with uh, Rita Dove. Um, I'm forgetting everybody who was there. But it was like a, a poet, a journalist, a novel writer, and um, I think it was uh, the guy who did, who does all the law story, stories that have become movies. Can't think of his name right now. But they were all talking, and um, one of the things they suggested writers do, they said, if you have the idea, write that down, and then you can either write up to it and then write backwards to it. Um, and so that's what happened with that one. I knew what I wanted to say in the middle of it. I knew I wanted to call those men's names. That part of it, I was sure about. But I didn't know how to get there. I was like, where do I start? <laughs> and then how is it going to end? And so that, that process was like, I almost had to meet the poem in the middle to get to that one. Some of them, are, I, you know, they just come out. Um, when I first started writing, writing, I didn't use a thesaurus. I didn't, you know, because I was like, oh, it has to be pure, it has to be organic, it has to come from me. And then I was like, you know, you use the, water, the word water a lot, let's find another <laughs> word. You know, use the word atmosphere a lot, let's find another you know. But it was, you know, I was like, oh, it has to be pure. Yeah. It has to come from me. And, it, and then I was like, uh, then I didn't want to use a poetry form. And I was like, no, I, I you know, put this in a form or, you know. Um, so, yeah, yeah. It, it goes back and forth for me sometimes. Yeah, it's uh, like the variety of the forms that you, yeah. that you work in, uh, from prose-like to a um, couple of rhyming. Right. Um, do you do other forms besides what we were calling poetry? Um, plays or novels or essays? I'm working on a short play, what I think is going to be a short play. <laughs> but um, I actually, well, 
Enrico knows this. Um, we used to work at a place called Topaz, and we did hotel reservations. And some of the things we heard from people over the phone, and I used to turn to them and I said, you know, if I was really smart, I'd take a playwriting course, or I'd take a screenwriting course and turn this into a TV show. <laughs> the stuff we hear, you know. But I've never done it. So um, that's my next move is to, because I have ideas, but I don't, I don't know that world enough to, to say I can write a play. So there's some tools that I think I need to learn to complete it. Um, my next project, my next book, I'm hoping is to be a collection of acting flash fiction, um, where it's um, some fiction stories, but it's not a full novel, but a collection of, of stories. Um, I was talking to this uh, about another writer. He said, I don't know if I can write fiction, but I know I can lie. I said, well, you can, I said, well, you can write fiction. And you can lie. So I said, all you have to do then is come up with some characters' names and situations and things like that. So. Um, Give it context. Right. So I said, well, yeah, I can, I can do that, you know, <laughs> so, but um, I, um, I think there are some things I need to do just from a technical standpoint to, to make that happen. So there are other things I, I, I definitely want to do, um, but, um, you know, I, I, I want to take some steps that it's done to my satisfaction. Well, I'd like to hear that you're working on developing. I like the way you describe uh, the development of your craft. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> from having something to say to discovering different ways to say it. Yeah. Not just uh, uh, the message, but the variety of ways the message is conveyed. Um, could you talk a little bit about? Community. Uh, who? How? How has your work grown with others? Uh, you know, not just from from you starting, you know, alone in your notebook to you talk about a, a, a jazz. What was that? Yeah, it was a place in LA called Poets Jazz House. Um, I actually used to perform with a vocalist um, where he would. Sing and I, you know, I, you know, um, and we put a lot out a CD, which is there's a copy of it on the cover of the book. Um, and he and I started because there was I would I used to go to this um, group called uh, In the Meantime, which was a group uh, for uh, black gay men. And the coordinator of the group, his name was Jeffrey King. He was having a birthday. He said, Hey, will you come do a poem for my? You know, I said, Yeah, I'll come do it. And I have this one piece that um, I knew. There's an old song in the black church. Um, I, I think it's called Pray For Me. Probably, you know, oh, well, now I'll pray. Yeah. <laughs> and I knew I wanted a vocalist for that. So um, he and I were just passing each other one time. And I said, hey, what are you doing on oh, such and such and such? And he's like, oh, nothing. You know, I said, well, I have this poem. And I gave him a copy of it. And he came up with this whole thing. And um, so we performed it, and it went really well, so then we started working together. We were going to feature at Poets Jazz House, um, he and I, and so we went to go check it out like a week before we were going to feature, just to go look and see, you know. Um, but they ended up asking us to come and do something that night to preview the next week. And so we did. And then the next week, we, you know, we had like a 15-minute feature spot. So we did that. And then I just kept going and going and going. And he wasn't going with me anymore. And I just kept going. And um, in that community, um, we just really used to feed off of each other. Um, I think it helped me with my writing in that when I got up there, I, I wanted to have something to say. Um, but it was how to get to your point, you know. Um, there are some people in the spoken word community no shade, but there's some people in the spoken word community, I know he's going to agree with this, that just like to get up and they have a rhythm and a cadence and some words and that's it. <laughs> and you're like, okay, what are they talking about? It sounded good, you know, but what, you know, what are they talking about? You yeah. feel like the communication was like... Yeah, it's like, okay, it's, um, 
One of the things that influenced me with spoken word is growing up in the black church, we gave speeches for Easter and Christmas. And um, at one point I realized that there were um, some older black people who didn't have a chance to go to school or come finish school. Because, you know, you get up and you give your speech, and, and it went in order. Like, the little kids would get up and they'd have, like, two lines. And by the time you were in high school, you had this big, long, grand speech. With all, and invariably, some lady would pull me to the side and say, Baby, I don't know what you said, but you said the words. <laughs> you know? Meaning they didn't understand what I was saying because they didn't have a chance to complete school. Hmm. But it sounded good. Hmm. And that's how it is it's, with some small word people. It sounds good. You know, but I have no idea what you're saying. Mm -hmm. um, and so that place, Forest Jazz House, really helped me develop that part of it. It's like, what do you want to say? Um, there's a friend of mine, her name is Marcy. She, um, she got sick of guys telling her, you ain't shit. And so one week she came in and she had this piece called, I'm the shit. <laughs> you know? Because she got sick of it. You know, she just turned the whole thing around. Because she said, she said she had dated a couple of guys that who, who told her that, you know, you ain't, you know. So she's like, well, I am, you know. And she turned the whole thing around. We were like, wow, that's how you do it. That's how you can take a phrase or a word or something and turn it around and make it into something and make it mean something. Um, and um, it used to be every Thursday. And like I said, we started at 8, we took that break, and then, you know, but we had uh, poets and, and singers, and so it was a lot of influences. Even comedians would come in. And even with co comedians, I think the comedians who have something to say, at least to me, are the ones that you really want to, you know. So you, you go back and forth from Southern Cal to here? Um, not as much, no. Okay. So you're <laughs> yeah. mostly living here? Yeah. What are your um, favorite venues here? You know, I haven't found a regular venue here. Um, we both were uh, going to uh, the Grand Lake, Hot well, it was called Perch. Yeah. Um, I had, uh, I actually met Ramon where I was a judge at a 12 word event and he ended up winning. And then I had featured at this coffee house and then I asked him to come feature at this coffee house. And then I was doing a spoken word choir at my church, and I needed one more person. I asked him to come and fill in and, and be that person. He ended up joining the church. <laughs> so we just kind of have this thing where, you know, he, like I said, he's a playwright and everything, and I've never really, I mean, I've acted in small roles and stuff like that, but if he called me and needed me, I'd do it because on the strength of him being, uh, me knowing who he is as a writer and as a person. Um, so I, I found these spots, but I haven't found a regular spot. Um, and I wish I can. I, I really want to because it really feeds my creativity. Um, when I was working at, at Topaz, my creativity got zapped. <laughs> the, the nature of that kind of work. Mm. Um, yeah, there are different energies. And some feed and some, yeah. some take it out of you. Yeah. Uh, Welcome. I'm glad we had a couple more people show up uh, partway through. I'm sorry you missed as, so much of the reading, but do you have some thoughts or do you have requests uh, for uh, Jair? We'd be happy to have a little discussion. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't get to request anything. Well, I, I, I guess um, uh, I have a two-part question. Um, I, I heard the uh, the poem on um, loving books and yeah, it's a question like, okay, so what are you doing right. this? I would be considered a slut. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so um, I'm wondering, um, what's the name of that that poem first of all? And secondly, um, how do I get a copy of your, your actual um, book? Um, I have both books here for sale. Um, they're ten dollars each. If you want to get both of them, it'll be fifteen dollars. So you can take care of that. Um, that one is called Word Ho. Oh, Word Ho. Yeah. <laughs> Again, it was taking something negative and trying to make something positive of it, you know. And and with that one, I knew I wanted to use, um, you know, the idea of, of of being pimped out for words and stuff like that. Um, and even the part where I mentioned Stevie Wonder. 
I was listening to that song one time, and you know, in, it, it, it's in the van where he says, I've been loving you always, and, and the background singers say, until the day that eight time eight, time eight is four. And I'm like, whoa, <laughs> it just blew my mind that he could think of that because he's saying, I love you always, and then they're saying, until the day that eight time eight, time eight is four. Now we know mathematically that eight times eight times eight times eight will never be four. So that's how intense he is about meeting the love you. It just really blew my mind, you know, that he could come up with a, a phrase like that. Um, and so I knew I wanted to include things like that. That it was like, you know, wow, that's it's mind blowing that until the day that I'll be loving you until the day that eight times eight times eight is four. Mathematically, we know that can never happen. So that's a really long time that he's making this declaration. Um, so it's impossible to happen. Right. You know, it, it, so to include that was just very poetic to me. I think we don't give enough credit to people like Stevie Wonder or you know, Paul McCartney and other people who come up with these lines that are like, that's really poetry. And um, I think um, we miss out a lot, of, a, a lot of times, even with, with rappers. Sometimes rappers come up with stuff and it's like, whoa, <laughs> stop here. <laughs> Did you hear what you just said? <laughs> uh, with spoken word, uh, which uh, when I was introduced to poetry wasn't really a thing, um, but then along came spoken word and slam, yeah. uh, and performance got really, got credit, mm -hmm. where you know, the, the cafe poets who was like droning on and they're like, you know, I don't know, you know, you could barely understand what they're saying, switched uh, the, the slams and the spoken word competitions then really brought performance to the fore. Mm -hmm. Was that always available when you started? You said you got kind of started kind of late. Yeah, it was. Um, at first, I was afraid of it. Like I said, you know, growing up, in, especially in the black church, um, getting up and doing those speeches, um, being able to speak well was considered a gift mm -hmm. because I come I I come from a background where there were people who just they didn't have access to be able to finish school. They didn't, you know, they had to start working when they were young or. You know, they were from the South and, and had migrated north and, and things like that. So when you were able to speak well and communicate well, they considered that a gift as much as singing or as much as, you know, mm -hmm. it was really a gift. Especially a young child, if you were able to get up there and not be nervous. I'm the youngest of 10. Ooh. And um, <laughs> when those speeches would come around, my family would like drill it into me because like you're not gonna get up there and embarrass us. You're gonna, <laughs> you're gonna know your speech, and and damn you, you're gonna be one of those kids that get up there and get nervous and cry. You are that. You're not gonna get up there and embarrass the whole Trice family. <laughs> but little did I know, I had a you know I had a picture for it. You know that you know I I felt comfortable doing it. Um, I think I've said this to be, to to you before, and I, I know I've said it to to Rome before. Um, poets, I feel, and spoken word artists, are introverted hands. <laughs> you know, we start off where we're like, it's very personal. You know, these are my feelings. Da -da -da -da. And then once you get us up there, we don't want to get off the stage <laughs> because it feels so good to get feel that energy and get that immediate feedback of spoken word. You know, and so it, there's just a, 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 an energy to it. When it's good, when it's going well, when you're in an environment where people are supporting, there are some environments in, in this home work community where they're judging you and you know picking you apart and things like that. And sometimes that doesn't even have to do with what you're saying or performing. But um, but yeah, there's something to that. So for me, it started there, and then as when I got to places like Poets Jazz House, there's a great old one that's when, actually I heard had been going on since the '60s. In, um, in Venice, California, um, called at, at this place called Abbott's Habit, um, that I heard some of the San Francisco beat poets used to go down there and perform and things like that. Um, I think also the influence of like the Harlem Renaissance, you hear about people getting together 
and having writ parties or you know and, and the poets would get yeah, up there's and definitely a tra tradition of performance right it was kind of fallow when, when I yeah when I have uh, hit the scene we have a comment or question a question yeah because even your name or your, your performance name is um, fearless I should say a lot of your work is very fearless did you start off that way? How did you get to a point where you didn't really care how you hit people with your words? Well, to be fair, <laughs> when I, like I said, when I first started sharing, especially publicly, um, a lot of the writing was to heal myself. So it was very, very spiritual. You know, it was very about overcoming and about being able to, to endure and things like that, which is included in the book as well. Mm -hmm. um, the literary masturbator thing came because I had this one particular night where I was at Poets Jazz House and, you know, we'd get up and share for maybe three to five minutes. But this one particular night, something was going on and so the, the producer and the host was like, keep going, keep going, keep going. And so I kept going and I was up there for maybe 10 or 15 minutes and I just felt this energy where I was, I, <laughs> I felt this energy like after sex is you know that blissful feeling after you have really good sex where you're like ooh, <laughs> and I felt that energy and I was on my way home afterwards that night and I was like wow that was really sensual and you know and I was like what is that what was that you know and I was like it's almost like I was up there having sex with you. But I was by myself, so it must have been like I was masturbating. And, and that's how that whole thing came about. Now, I know when people see the name, it's pretty provocative. And usually the first reaction is people laugh because they're like, oh. And I think that's because a lot of times in those instances, people aren't uh, comfortable mm -hmm. with things like say masturbation or masturbator out loud. They're just not comfortable with the thought of it. Um, it's why I like to perform the signature piece. So people have the context of where it comes from. Mm -hmm. And it's not just, I'm saying it just to shock you or to be provocative or anything like that. There is something behind it. Um, there are times when I shy away from it. You know, I'll, you know, I was like, just introducing it to John Gary, don't you know? <laughs> I don't want to have to live up to that whole thing. But, um, Yes, I did have. Oh, I did. <laughs> Let me go ahead. Are you done? I, I, I did have some issue with my supervisor over calling the literary masturbator. Uh, I when you said when you when I got the uh, chat books and I saw it on there, I was like, he's gonna have this in all the public libraries. Yeah, 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 I, I said we have banned books week. Damn it! <laughs> we, have, we, we can do this. This is not an X-rated word. Yeah, and so yeah, I. Um, but it, you really have to <clears throat> stand in yourself to, to be able to do it. Um, that's, I mean, I hope that doesn't come off as egotistical. But you really have to stand in yourself and, and know who you are to be able to take that on. Um, and, but that goes back to what I was saying earlier. Like, you know, there's a lot of people who, who, um, who get up and you don't know what to, what's behind what they're doing. And I'm not talking about new people, because I'm very supportive of people who are getting up for the first time or you know, are, you know, are beginning to express themselves, who are trying to find themselves. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about people who... Sounds like a pet peeve. Yeah, it is. It really is. It really is. Uh, I don't know. Do we have other... Uh... I want to say, you know, use that phrase of introverted ham. And I think um, it's like, it just kind of explained, it was like a little click in myself when you said that as, as I encounter people in my life, there is occasionally a draw to some people. And that from, from that first interaction, I wouldn't necessarily know why. And it's like, and I see you, you're not introverted, but you're very much um, content with yourself. And so, but there is always, for me, from the first time I met you, it's like, I'm not sure what's up with this guy, but there's something there. And it's like, and just being here at this, at this event lets me know what that thing was that was drawing me. And, and so it just, it was really amazing how you just click that. It's just a click, now I know. 
Yeah. And so it kind of helped me. It's like just now that I, as I, as I meet other people like that, it's like I'm just waiting to discover what that click is. You know, now there's, there's a reason to be patient sometimes or, or to just try to get to know someone instead of waiting them to, to open up to me. Maybe I can help in that process to, to see what's drawing me. So I'm really amazed by your performance, by the way. Oh, thank it's you. It's like, um... John said he was going to come here today and heckle me. So really <laughs> yeah, I was going to be his heckler. <laughs> it's a, he, yeah. he designated himself as my heckler, so <laughs> I'm very happy to hear that. <laughs> the thing is, I was, as I was listening to you, and I've seen your books, and I've read your book, is hearing the words come out of your mouth is like a whole different thing to just sitting and reading. And it's much, it's more amazing to me, personally. The first thing I was thinking is, when does he do this? Right. You know, it's like, when does this happen? I've known you for a while, I see you doing this, like, when is this happening? Where is this going on that, that he's hidden somewhere <laughs> and these things are, are happening? It's actually Clark Kent and Superman. Right? <laughs> it's, it's, actually, it's actually always happening. I, um, like I said with that, the second piece, I don't know if it's finished. I heard this in some writing workshop or writing class somewhere. Writers write so we can edit. That's our main focus for writing. That's, that's really why we want to write, just so we can go back and edit. <laughs> Even after the book came out, I was like, oh yeah, I can edit that. I can, you know, like, still you, edit. you don't finish, you stop. Right. <laughs> <laughs> what is your favorite place to write? Um, I actually love libraries. I used to work at the LA. I don't think I've ever told you this. I used to work at the library in LA. When I started writing for healing, I would go to the library and um, didn't have a computer at the time. So all that handwritten stuff, I had to actually type up you know, to get it. I didn't know if I was going to publish. I didn't know what I was going to do. Um, but I love a good library. I love this library because they have that little alcove there. And you know, sometimes the sunshine is coming in. And even when it's raining, it's really nice. Um, I love the library. Um, I like water sources. Sometimes I'll go take my tablet to Lake Merritt. Mm -hmm. And if I have the germ of the idea, like I was saying before, I just make sure it's stored in my tablet or stored in my phone somewhere so I can go back to it and, and work it out, you know. So sometimes there, you know, um, I want, you know, my, uh, what I consider my meditation music, um, which can go anywhere from jazz or, classical or you know lo-fi hip-hop whatever you know whatever I consider meditation at that moment um, water sources are, are a great place for me to write um, and you know in Southern California of course I meant easy access to the beach because it was right there here it's usually like merit um, because the beach is just not like right there like it is in LA. <laughs> It's over the bridge, you know, in San Francisco. There's too many marshes in front of our bay. Right. <laughs> uh, any other thoughts? Go ahead. I'm I like to speak. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Well, no, I was just curious as to, like, I don't know what I missed, because, you know, I went to the wrong library. Walking through life, you just always find something like just like walking here today. Like I, I don't, I don't write, but I saw a lot of things just writing here today. You find stuff to write about just just walking down the street. Yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> the yes is there was a time where everything was a poem to me. Everything I had to turn everything you know, and that's when I was in that environment of you know I was around people who were creating and you know, and so everything became. I mean, it could have been a praise. It could have been uh, something somebody said. I was at a um, church in L.A. one time, and the pastor was preaching. And my church in L.A. is an affirming church for gays and lesbians. So is my church here. But uh, he was up, and he was talking about before the church began. He said, you know, we'd go to the club, and we'd be in the club, and, you know, the music would be playing, and it would be going, and somebody would pull out a tambourine. And he said, and it became church for them. You know, and this was in the club. They were listening to some disco record, you know, and it was just going. And and in that moment, I was like, oh, okay, huh? And that became a poem, which I know you've heard called "Idol Worship." You know, where it was like it was about the club 
and this guy going to the club to get salvation, and, and that's where he, you know, 